Okay, now we're back. We're going to go into a little more detail now about this switch in metaphors from Kurias, which is going to continue all the way to the end of, you know, this prophecy, which goes to through the end of chapter 30, uh, 25. We're going to we're going to go into more detail about the switch of metaphors from Kurias to Nufias. Kurias means Lord, Master. It's got the strong authoritarian connotation, a strong connotation of you know the legal relationship between somebody and you. And of course, the happy end of it would be if that Lord is God because He's always good, He's always loving, He's always everything you ever wanted in a Lord. Okay, the last use of that term prior to the switch to bridegroom, which is an advance on, you know, loving, caring, your husband, the whole bit. Before we switch over, the last use, as I covered in a previous increment, historically, if you count the syllables, this is 1607 plus 30, 1637, 1638, 1639, XA, ho. That's 1640, 41, 42. This is the period, and we know we're in, still in England because we just finished with the English Reformation here, and, and it's not yet over really. This should have been 1610, but it's not, and that's been bothering me for months. Okay, well, that's why, because here's the 1610, right? See, that's 1607, 8, 9, and 10 begins at the article of the noun. Alright, that's the normal use when you say a noun in Greek, you have the article in front of it. And then later on you can remove the noun because you've got the article that identified it prior. So it ends up being used as a pronoun. Okay, that's why it's cut short here. And you say, well, brain out, you know, how do you know the verse is the way it should be or the text is the way it should be? Well, this is how you do know. See, what you're really supposed to do, and I, I sort of short-circuited it here, but you're really supposed to be breaking out this text per clause. Okay? Sometimes you don't have to because you realize, all oh, the clause isn't going to seven, so it doesn't really matter, and that's kind of the format I made here. But see here? This is all part of the same verse. I'm in lego hum in hoti. Okay? This is all part of the same sentence. But I broke it after hoti into the clause of the content of the hoti, because that's how you do it in Greek. And also, what changes the clause, makes it a new clause, is epi. Most clauses that are separate, when you go to break out a clause in the text, it usually begins with a preposition or ta, or something that distinguishes, ta is like, used like a bullet point. Something that distinguishes the clause. Because what you want to see is whether the writer is sevening to a clause. And here we know that he is because it's an anaphora. And I already saw that. I found this in Paul first. I didn't know that Matthew 24 then existed as, you know, a prophecy text. So it, so it sevens at Amen Lego Humin Hoti. So then the next clause, which begins with Epi, has its own sevening or its own syllable counts. And I could have just ignored the verses, but it's easier for you to follow. But this still ends a clause. I mean, the guys that came up with the verses were aware of how to read the text, at least that they knew where the clauses were. They, they're not, it's not always perfect, but it's generally good. Okay, so here's Hokurias. This is used for... 1611, 1612, 1613, and that was the King James Bible. A lot of people, especially the King James only, is who are clueless and conspiratorial. A lot of people aren't aware that the people who came up with the King James Bible, the translators, were commissioned by King James to do so. And they kept on revising it. Just like, you know, because see, they didn't have computers then. So when they do, they do what they came up with, and then they want to get it in the hands of people. And then they go back and they look at it. And they say, oh, we made some mistakes. So then they'd fix the mistakes and come out with a new edition. A new edition of the King James Bible. And they did that every single year. This was the first three years that they did it. And if you look in the preface of the 1611 edition, 
you'll notice that's exactly what they say, which of course the King James only is ignore. Hey, we came up with this. We know there's still errors. We're going to keep on revising it. All right. So every single year they came up with it, but these were the first three editions, and they, you know, had a lot of cleaning up that they did. So it's emphasized as curious because now the Word of God, who's a, who is God, is getting into your hands. And yes, it's only a translation. The translation's obviously not inspired, but this is contact with the Lord yourself. So you can have contact that's small, short shallow or you can have intimate contact intimate here the switch over to Numphias is talking about intimate contact here it's Hokurias, Lord of your life the Bible who's your Lord is it really God is it God in his word or are you gonna settle for a cheap you know um, political substitute that whole concept's being introduced here, and the reason we know that is that this is Charles replacing King James, because King James dies in 1603. Um, not, not 1603, uh, 1626. Charles replaces him, Charles is his son, and Charles wants to replace the lordship of the Bible in people's lives to some kind of structure that's more Catholic the way he thinks it should be and the people rebel against him and he's deposed their Lord is deposed in favor of the Lord who wrote the original languages original texts of scripture which are translated into the King James which the Lord of his father you know King James father of Charles had authorized so the son is going against the father's own authorization. And so the people rebel against their own Lord in favor of the Lord. That's, you know, that's precedenting for what comes next. Because now we're going into the intimacy of contact with the Lord. He's not just your Lord, he's your husband. Okay, what's intimacy? Making love, being married, having kids. Okay, so now we're focusing not just on translations, but on original manuscripts and anything that exposes or otherwise makes more available or more intelligible the original manuscripts. And one of them that came out during the very year that they were arguing over who was going to be the husband of the Holy Roman Empire in 1749 some guy, and you can buy this in Amazon, I haven't done it yet, comes up with a, with a metered translation of the last words of Daniel in 2 Samuel 23. And the only reason I haven't bought his translation yet is because I can read the Hebrew myself. So I just went and looked at the Hebrew myself of 2 Samuel 23, and you bet it's metered. And the first time the text divides by 7, which is the date line, is 77. That's David's age when he writes his last word, because that's the year he dies. Okay, which you can know without knowing the meter, as I explained before. But see, husband, intimate, okay, it's not just your boss, he's not just your lord, he's not just your leader, he's not just a guy that runs your country. You're intimate with him. That's the switch, and of course, the distance between Numphias here with its definite article and the previous Hokurias is divisible by seven. Go count the syllables yourself. You can do that just by looking at this. Okay? It's divisible by seven. So it's very much intended to switch the metaphor, and it's a metaphor of intimacy. Okay? That's the point here. Now, there are other things that happen during this time. 17, four, see, that's 1749, final syllable that's marked in red, U, okay, Numph, and you could actually probably say few is the last syllable, that's how they do it, they parse it in Greek. So Num would be 1748, and Tu would be 1747. Those are real important years in America for the establishing of colonies, establishing of universities that are about teaching Bible. There were manuscripts that came out that they were working on. It had become to be something of a commonality that if you were a gentleman or a lady, 
you new scripture on your own. And that would continue to be true. Okay? It was only until, I want to say it was like the 1950s, where they stopped teaching Greek and Hebrew in the schools. I have lexicons from high school. Okay? In Greek, um, I don't have it for Hebrew, and Latin. I went to Latin class. Mine was one of the last generations that had Latin class as a, as a normal thing in high school. Okay? They stopped doing that because there stopped being interest in it. All right, so then you don't want to be intimate with your Lord if you don't want to read the actual words he wrote. See, this is intimacy right in front of your face. This is a Greek text that Christ himself is speaking. He is speaking this parable. These are his own words. And the reason why you know they're his own words is because you can count, you can see the meter counts. And as I showed you in previous videos, Luke is actually doing that. But Luke stops counting the syllables in his, you know, talking back to this passage. He stops right here and he, he makes this 1085 for reasons I don't yet know why. But Christ's actual words go on. And now Christ is talking about a parable of the ten virgins who are supposed to meet the bridegroom and then the idea is that he picks one of them or all ten of them and they become part of his harem. If you were really rich in the ancient world, in the ancient oriental world, that's what you did. It had a lot of diplomatic purposes to it as well as the you know, idea of creating a whole family of your family so they could be trusted to have a government position and wouldn't steal from you, ha ha, stuff like that. Okay, so that's what this is all about here. Tunumfu, the bridegroom. All right. So there was a bridegrooming. There was an intimacy developing with the actual original text as being one of them. Okay, of the actual words the bridegroom said. And that's how you learn to understand. Okay, now I know how to interpret this section of of scripture, because of what it came from. The provenance is overruling against their Lord, secular Charles, in favor of the Lord, spiritual Christ, so that they can read his word their way. And so now that paves the way for a more intimate understanding of the way he talked here in Greek. These are his words. All right even though it's been copied many times even though there are many errors in any one individual copy the corpus that we have we will be able to know which in every single verse which words are really his that's intimacy with him if you want intimacy with your husband you want to hear his words see it's a very clever shorthand way of for people who would memorize the text orally very clever shorthand way of telling you about what history is going to be like during this period so every time now when you see Numphias you're looking for the word coming out in the original text you're looking about some kind of reference to Bible, Bible teaching um, Bible availability in the original text and like I said there's the book that came out in 19, 1749 about the original words of David trying to translate them into English that matches the Hebrew syllabification he used that came out that year and you can still buy it in Amazon okay or just look it up in the Hebrew of 2nd Samuel 23 alright you see how useful this is alright so then the next occurrence of it is right here and that spans a period of 1818 to 1820 and that's going to be findings of scripture a lot of scripture, one of the biggest things about the 19th century, the biggest movement, was the establishment of universities for teaching and understanding of scripture in the original languages, especially in the United States. And actual finding of Bible text, the finding of the Bible text was occurring all over Europe. And a lot of the people in Europe were so interested in it, like Tischendorf, for example, who is spotlighted here. This is Tischendorf. Were so interested but they went to the Middle East looking for the manuscripts. So that's a movement that started during this time right here. Now, Satan's not going to just sit there and let you find the intimate words of your husband without trying to contest it. So, 
Here's where the satire comes in. There's a fake husband that starts during this time. I'm sure, and we already know about the fake husband here because this is the War of Austria in succession who's going to husband the Holy Roman Empire. So you're busy focusing on it rather than the Word of God. Well, here we got another husband. 1818 to 1820, and in 1820, there was a guy in New York who called himself Joseph Smith, and he had a vision. And here, this is covering Tischendorf and his find of the Codex Sinaiticus at, at St. Catharines, and it wasn't only that, you know, Codex found that year. But not only that, but Joseph Smith has another vision, and this is when the Book of Mormon and all that other stuff starts in earnest. You see, fake husband versus real husband, and of course, what's the keynote in Joseph Smith? You can have lots of wives. You see how clever Christ is? And Matthew is, you know, God directs Matthew how to package this text, because in Greek, you don't have to put this text in this order. In other words, this is coming up at a certain particular set of years, 1818 to 1820. They could have moved the words around. And this wouldn't be at 1818 to 1820. And it would still have the same meaning. But it's organized. See, these are this has been my biggest question to God ever since I was a little girl. Why are these your words in your book? And why are they in this order? Because they're kind of funky. So now I'm 63 and he's giving me answer after answer after answer. And now you can see the answer too. Why is to Numfu here? Why isn't it... Why isn't it to numfu chronizontas? What to numfu da chronizontas? You could say it that way in Greek. And the bridegroom was delaying. You could say that in Greek in a different order. So chronizontas would be where to numfias is. But it isn't. Because this is satire against the false versus the true. So a bunch of real Bible manuscripts are for real intimacy with your real husband who's really the Lord of the Word of God. You know, see, I'm in Lego Homing. Yeah, I'm talking. It's got a compet, 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 hmm, competing suitor. Joseph Smith gets his first vision in 1820. And then Joseph Smith, who wants to marry everybody, every gal he sees, kind of like Donald Trump. Oh, you can have as many wives as you want. See, I'm the husband, multiple wives. This is when Mormonism gets officially started and, they, and the authorities are chasing them out because, you know, it's a false Christ. It's false husbanding. They actually, Mormonism is actually anti-Semitic in its orientation. It aims to replace and say that they're the real Jews, that the Jews that left got destroyed when the first temple went down and they circumnavigated the globe, came to America, and they're the real Jews. That's why they're real big on genealogy. Okay, see, husbanding. Ha ha. See, so it's got that satire component that you have to keep on keeping, keeping aware of so that when you get down to Korea, you realize that there's a satire going on there. All right? So you got Honum Fias, and this is this is the discovery of Sinaiticus and um, other manuscripts at that time. But Sinaiticus was the most important among them by Tischendorf, and you can go look that up. Uh, it's also called Codex Aleph. And Joseph Smith is the fake bridegroom. Okay, to take your attention away from the real Bible. Because when you read the Book of Mormon, it, it changes the words of the Bible around. In other words, like in Acts, it says, There is no other name under heaven whereby you must be saved. In the Book of Mormon, they change it to uh, that you might be saved. So, see, you know, you have to stay under, under the Mormon leaders because they're the ones that can actually make sure you get saved. Same gambit that's used in the Quran. You might be saved, you might not. You can never be sure of your salvation. That's why you need us as your religious leaders to husband you. Whereas the real husband is saying, Hi, I paid on the cross, it's over. The minute you believed in me, you're married to me, and it's up to me, not you. I'm the one who paid, not you. 
I paid the bride price on the cross, not you. So you can't lose your salvation because I'm the husband. See? Fake or true husband. False or real Christ. False or true Lord. The satire is all there in evidence. Just because you know the meter and you can count the syllables and then you look it up in history. Because for us, this is history. For people at the time, they could have known to be forewarned against Joseph Smith. And then once they heard about Tischendorf, it's like, oh, that's the real Numphias. Because that was one of our most reliable manuscripts, Codex Sinaiticus. Okay? Which I intimately have on my own computer, and I can look at, it, at an actual photograph of that manuscript. Actual photograph. Of course, there's a transliteration of it. Alright? See? Idu! Here! Look! Here's the bridegroom. Yeah, the real one. And meanwhile, Joseph Smith's being trotted out by Satan is the fake one saying, Oh, see, I'm the real bridegroom. Tale of two bridegrooms. Ha ha. Alright, so then we come down here, and it's like, Whoa, what's this? This is the coming of the bridegroom. In other words, while the stupid girls who didn't have the Holy Spirit in them are supposed to get their oil just as they're leaving to go buy it that's 1960 okay it starts at 1960 in comes the actual bridegroom okay so this is a term for bridegroom so that spans 1976 5 and 4 so who is the bridegroom in 1974 Four, five, and six, that's the fake one. How about politics? Okay, this was when Reagan rose to power. Okay, and Reagan rose to power by playing footsie with the apostate Christians. And he had started doing it back in 1960. Jerry Falwell and his foolish virgins. Who think they can buy oil. You can't buy filling of the spirit. You use one John 1 9 to get it. I'm running out buying oil. And just as they're leaving, here is coming from 1960 onward the actual bridegroom. The real one. Not the fake one. The real one. Well, how is, it, how is that true? Well, if you go back and you look at Bible teaching, there was an explosion of Bible teaching in the 1960s and Jerry Falwell and company decided well they didn't Bible wasn't good enough for them they wanted to become politically active the point is, is that the explosion of Bible teaching meant that a whole lot of people were learning it a whole lot of people were interested in what it said and that was on the backs of all this Bible manuscripts coming out because it takes time for the Bible manuscripts to come out. And then, of course, we had several wars in between. That'll make people sit up and take notice and get interested in God. So after World War II, there was an explosion of interest in Bible. Meanwhile, the foolish, Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, all those guys were young then. Jerry Falwell Sr. They decided to get political. And Ronald Reagan was just rising then. And by 1974, 75, 76, that was, of course, you know, the downfall of Nixon, who had also cultivated Falwell, and, and Jerry um, Ford being at the nominating convention. But as soon as they nominate Ford, they realize it should have been Reagan. Reagan was courting the Christian right, okay, avidly. So you got the tale of two bridegrooms. Again, the fake bridegroom highlighted here is political. Okay? The real bridegroom is the Lord and the teaching that comes out as a result of all those manuscripts which exploded in interest from 1916 through 1976. And I know about that because that was the period during which I lived. I was ten. I was what seven years old in 1960, and my pastor happened to be one of the teachers who was teaching from the original languages, which is why I can just 
you know, highlight these words on the screen right now. I already know what they mean because I've spent my life in it because he spent his life in it and he spent his life teaching it to the whole congregation. We all learn these words in the original Hebrew and Greek. That's how we learn Bible. We didn't learn it like other people do. And it wasn't just our congregation. There were thousands of them. And the reason I know there were thousands of them is my pastor kept on making traveling, kept on traveling all around the United States, visiting all kinds of other congregations who wanted him to speak. And then those pastors were teaching their congregations in the original languages too. So it was a phenomenon of the period. You have the tale of two phenomena. First of all, the politicizing of Christianity. This is when pro-life develops. There had never been a pro-life movement in history until this point. And it was a way to politicize Christianity. The foolish virgins are going to go to the market and sell themselves. Meanwhile, the real Numphias is arriving through Bible teaching. And that's also popular. You see? So that's the satire here. It's arriving through Bible teaching because the Bible was more intimately available, especially starting here in the 1840s. And yeah, there was a Joseph Smith suitor competition. But there were so many manuscripts that were found and collated and so much Bible teaching. This is when all the lexicons that you'll see online, this is when they started being developed. I mean, it was a total revolution in Bible teaching and understanding. And it finally became popular in the 1960s. But right alongside it were the apostates who wanted to politicize Christianity. And this is when the stupid disgusting anti-Christ, anti-God, anti-everything, holy, pro-life movement is born. And they're the ones who put Donald Trump in office. So you'll notice this is all part of the same story of the foolish virgins. This is when the remaining foolish virgins return. See? After a while, the foolish virgins come in and they say, Lord, Lord. Yeah. That's where we are now. The last syllable of this second Lord is 2018. All because they're rejecting the bridegroom. They're rejecting the intimacy with Christ, which comes from learning the original languages in the original words of Scripture that the original writers wrote, which are right in front of your screen for Matthew. So they're rejecting intimacy. And you'll notice they're saying, Lord, Lord. They're trying to get like, what do you want to call it, compliment. Oh, if we call you Lord, you have to open to us. That's what those Greek words mean. Anoiks on homie. Kyrie, Kyrie. Anoiks on homie. And that's what the seven mountains group around Donald Trump. That's exactly what they think they're doing. Is by backing Trump, they think they're going to bring Christ back. Go look it up. Seven Mountains. Some other people call that same movement dominionism. Go look it up in YouTube. You'll hear them talk themselves. Not somebody criticizing them. Them talk. Then look it up in Google also. They think they're bringing Christ back. They think they're supposed to unite church and state. Their Revelation 17, hence the term Seven Mountains. They think that's a good thing. Now, any sane person would read Revelation 17 and see the word harlot and say, Oh, no, God doesn't like this unity of church and state. But these people are so anti-God, they reverse everything he says. Of course, he also said, John 18, 36, My kingdom is not of this world. But they're trying to make it of this world. Backing Trump now starting here with Jerry Falwell, of course Jerry Falwell Jr. is backing Trump now, starting here with Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, James Dobson, all those other jerk-offs, who as they're leaving, they can't hear the bridegroom coming through the original tongues of scripture? That's how bad they are? So you have the tale of two cities here. 
The Tale of Two Lords, the real one versus the political fake that they create because they don't like the real Lord and they don't want intimacy with him. They'd rather be sterile and just say, Lord, Lord, rather than bridegroom, bridegroom. See, bridegroom. And then we go back to Kyrie, and the distance between the first Kyrie and Honun Fias here is also divisible by seven, which implies strongly that my syllable counts here are right. Now, in the next increment, which will be the final one, I'm gonna I'm gonna go through you know the outcome of that, which I've already covered here, where Christ by 2041 is basically proving to the world how he repudiates these disgusting pro-life jerks. He's going to advertise his repudiation of them. And by 2041, everybody's going to understand that. They might disagree or still be pro-life. But he's going to make it real clear. And they're going to be pushed out of politics. Okay, but what happens after that? Because what happens th here, this is the end of the bride, the, the ten brides, you know, the ten virgins parable. It ends right here. We can enter a new phase of history. Okay, this is like the epilogue. Be careful. You don't know what day I'm coming. And then we enter a whole new story about three servants. Well, what does that mean for future history? Because that's the millennials are going to be grandparents at that point. What does that mean? And that's where we're going to end the increment next time. Let's see, how do I turn this off?